Professor Pergantis. Thank you very much, dear Vasilis. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I guess also good evening and good morning. I see the conference is uh, very well attended. So I would guess that there might be speakers, uh, sorry, might be uh, attendees uh, from various time zones. So uh, hello, everybody. It is indeed a great honor and a great pleasure uh, to, to uh, chair the first panel of uh, today's inaugural conference of the Jean Monnet uh, project on the EU responsibility in the international system. Um, particular uh, uh, greetings uh, in regards to Professor Kufa. Uh, I am particularly happy to see you even uh, through the camera and of course all the other colleagues and friends whom I have missed very much all those months, uh, almost a year that uh, uh, we have been away and we only see each other through a camera. Uh, I will leave all these pandemic uh, um, issues aside and uh, I will uh, immediately um, uh, start uh, uh, with uh, our first um, uh, presenter, uh, who is uh, a very good uh, colleague and a very good friend, uh, Professor uh, Emanuela Dusis. Uh, who will deliver a presentation on revisiting the ILC's uh, area 10 years after their adoption, taking stocks and looking ahead, uh, which is uh, opening our panel on the ILC drafticles and EU responsibility, a general framework. Uh, Emanuela is professor at the University of Athens, director of the Institute of International Integration and Policy and UNESCO chairholder on climate diplomacy. She's also a member of the ILA Committee on the Role of International Law in Sustainable Development Management, excuse me, of Natural Resources and of the Greek National Committee for Adaptation on Climate Change. Uh, her research interests include international and European environmental policy, sustainable development law, climate diplomacy, including the EU climate diplomacy, and her more recent book concerns the international climate change regime. Uh, that, uh, Manuela is also the author of uh, the chapter on uh, the responsibility of international organizations uh, in uh, perhaps the leading uh, Greek uh, textbook on international law. Um, so Emanuela, uh, thank you very much uh, for accepting the invitation to present at today's conference and uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Ari. Uh, uh, dear colleagues, dear participants, uh, it is a great pleasure and an honor to participate in this event. I'm grateful to the organizers for their kind invitation and for the opportunity to share with such a distinguished audience some thoughts on the work of the ILC, the International Law Commission's work on concerning the responsibility of international organizations and the way it affects the EU in particular. Well, the purpose of my presentation is twofold. I will begin with some, with a couple of general remarks on the ILC's work on the topic and the critics raised so far to highlight the main concerns and challenges. I will then develop some brief considerations on whether the EU requires special treatment. I will also examine if and to what extent the articles on the responsibility of international organizations acknowledge the complex nature of the European Union and the distinct relations with um, its member states. I will conclude with some um, thoughts on the possible ways forward. A first remark I would like to make is that there is no doubt about the importance of the topic and the need for an international framework to hold international organizations responsible for their wrongful acts or omissions. Why so? Because their activities have impressively expanded, particularly since the 90s. And this proves that they play an uh, increasingly leading role in world politics. They administrate territories, distribute humanitarian aid, adopt international regulations, uh, sign treaties, uh, manage um, communications, health and trade, but they also send military forces to keep or enforce peace in conflict areas, or even stay passive in the midst of a genocide and so on and so forth. And they act not only 
as institutional fora of states, but as independent actors. So this increases the risk that the normative and operational activities do not develop as they were projected. In fact, the alleged violations and abuses of by um, UN peacekeepers in former Yugoslavia and elsewhere, or the conduct of national contingents that were part of the UN mission in Kosovo, for instance, began to raise more practical um, concerns. Therefore, when uh, the UN General Assembly asked the International Law Commission to consider the topic, there was an obvious need to clarify if there were any principles of international law governing this area, the responsibility of international organizations, a need to identify the conditions under which an, orga an international organization and its member states may be held responsible, uh, as well as the consequences of their internationally wrongful acts. And from 2002, this has been the task developed with unusual speed, I would say, by the ILC until 2011, when the second reading of the articles on international um, responsibility of international organizations was completed. So the outcome of the ILC's work on the topic is a set of 67 articles um, whose structure is almost completely the same as the one followed by the, in the earlier work of the ILC on state responsibility, with some adaptations were required by the specific nature of international organizations and some new additions. Thus, the 67 articles set out secondary rules concerning the preconditions uh, for the responsibility of international organizations to arise, the legal consequences and their implementation. They also include rules on the responsibility of a state in connection with the act of an international organization, an issue that deliberately was not included in the earlier work on state responsibility. As it is the case with state responsibility, two elements are required to help to hold uh, an international organization responsible. Number one, a breach of an international obligation. Number two, attribution of conduct. According to the articles, an international organization may be held responsible for acts and omissions that can be attributed to the organization concerned and which violate one of its international obligations. Well, both elements are somehow problematic and have raised uh, significant criticism so far. Uh, in fact, chains of attribution can be complicated in the context of international organizations and um, it is not clear how international organizations come to be bound by international law. The strongest criticism, however, points to the methodological approach followed by the International Law Commission. In brief, four group of arguments have been developed so far. A first group concerns the reliance of the articles on state responsibility and the fact that the bilateral foundation of the law of international responsibility cannot address complex relations between multiple actors. Admittedly, the articles take the traditional concept of the law of international responsibility and apply it to the independent conduct, conduct of international organizations and their member states, while other aspects, such as the cooperative and joint activity involving both, has not received much attention. A second group of arguments points to the lack of uh, existing practice upon which the articles are based. Therefore, the argument continues, the vast majority of the articles are in fact progressive development of international law rather than codification. Then a third group of arguments questions whether it is premature to develop those secondary um, obligations on international responsibility when often the primary obligations of international organizations are far from certain. And a fourth group of arguments points to the ability of the articles to address the wide range of international organizations um, 
from the United Nations and uh, specialized agencies to international financial institutions, regional economic organizations, to the international uh, sugar and cocoa organizations. In other words, organizations with differing functions, size, and types of relationships with their members. And this brings us to the heart, to the source of the difficulties with these articles, which are substantially exacerbated, I would say, when it comes to the European Union case, an institution which is very, very different from classic intergovernmental organizations. Actually, the European Union has progressed further than any other international organization in terms of developing an autonomous identity, both in an internal and external sense. Internally, it constitutes a particular legal order with wide stretched powers to develop an autonomous normative capacity. Externally, its competencies have expanded to such an extent, especially after the entry into force of the Lisbon Treaty, that it has become a global actor acting in almost all areas of international law. Moreover, it has a long list of treaty-based commitments, as it is party to many bilateral and multilateral treaties, in some cases alongside with uh, its member states in the so-called mixed agreements. In other words, the European Union constitutes a particular and highly integrated legal order that continuously interacts with international law. Therefore, it is more than any other international organization concerned by the articles as issues of responsibility arise more often, more frequently in this case than any other international organization. And it is not only the European Union as such that is concerned, but also its member states. It is a question of structure, of how the EU conducts its action while it progresses further towards an independence existence, at the same time it becomes increasingly dependent upon its member states for the practical implementation of both its own legislation and international commitments. And this is because the Union does not have the administrative capacity to implement its legislation and international commitments by itself, by its own means. So it heavily relies um, on its member states and their authorities uh, to carry out both union and, uh, and international law. Therefore, the special situation of the European Union results not so much from the fact that it has, ex it, uh, has extended competencies, but rather from the degree of normative control, normative power it exercises in its internal relationships with its member states. And the result is that making any determination of what each actor has committed is a complicated task. And this raises the question whether this phenomenon would require a special treatment, for instance, a special rule of attribution. Well, in brief, this was the line of reasoning that fell at the core of the debate surrounding the need to address in the articles the particular uh, institutional architecture of the European Union. And since the very beginning, since the circulation of the first drafts, the European Commission was one of the few entities which was very, very actively involved in the discussions with the International Law Commission and insisted on the need to take into consideration the special uh, institutional and legal characteristics of the Union, its role as a regional economic integration organization. More particularly, the Commission identified two main concerns raising issues for the purpose of international responsibility. First, the vertical dimension of the uh, relationship between the Union and Member States. So the fact that the implementation of European Union obligations is carried out by Member States and their authorities raises the question as to whether or when the Union incurs responsibility for actions of, uh, for acts of member states in implementing these obligations. According to the Commission, one, way, um, one of the ways to make such a determination would be through reference to the rules of the organization. 
The second concern focused on the horizontal relationship, namely the issues of areas of shared competence between the European Union and member states, and how any breaches in this area could be divided uh, between the two. So this touches upon um, the mixed agreements uh, to which both uh, the EU and member states are parties. So the Commission argued here that in such cases, responsibility should follow from competence. And one way in which this has been addressed uh, in practice is by declarations of competence to explain the division of competencies uh, between the Union and its member states and delineate responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis third parties to an agreement. And uh, such declarations of competence that form the basis uh, by which the, the, the nature of the Union can be understood by third parties can be found in several treaties, for instance, the Energy uh, Charter Treaty or the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. So the question here is how these concerns um, could be addressed uh, in the ILC's work on the topic. The European Union proposed three concrete solutions to address uh, these concerns. First, a special rule of attribution so that uh, the actions of the organs of member states can be attributed to organizations. In this sense, when member states implement an uh, EU binding act, state authorities would act as uh, organs of the Union. The second option was the implementation of, a special, of special rules of responsibility to enable responsibility to be charged to the organization, even if the prime actors in the breach of the organization's obligation were the organs of member states. And the final option was a special exemption or savings clause for the European Union. Well, the main idea behind these proposals um, was actually um, the same those actions that may factually be attributed to one actor may need to be addressed differently when the normative relations are considered. And it is worth noting that these comments were made before the entry into force of the Lisbon Treaty, which extended further the foreign relations uh, powers of the European Union in areas uh, such as foreign direct, in direct investment, but also in the areas of the common foreign and security policy and the common uh, security and defense policy where military, uh, civilian and other operations are involved. How these concerns expressed by the European Union been taken into consideration by the ILC? Well, when we look at the evolution of the drafts, we can see that the ILC made indeed attempts to address these concerns in the articles, however, with caution. No special rule of attribution as the one proposed by the Union has been incorporated in the articles, but nevertheless, in 2009, the ILC added a new provision providing a general potential exception. So according to Article 64, uh, where more specialized rules exist dealing with responsibility issues, they will apply <clears throat> in place of general principles of international law. So this is the so-called principle, uh, lex specialis principle, that leaves room for special regimes to be applied to international organizations if they decide to do so. In other words, it enables the European Union to contract out of the general regime of international law. And the reference to the rules of the organization in this provision goes some way towards what has been requested. So it can be argued that the ILC moved towards addressing the particular structure of the European Union, but attempted to do so um, in a general system of international rules. There are, however, several concerns, on, um, mostly on the practical implementation of this provision. Can the rules within the European Union be considered as lex specialis? Or does the lex specialis principle cover both areas uh, where the EU has exclusive and shared competence? And what happens in the areas where the European Union does not have extensive normative control, such as the common foreign and security policy uh, or the common security and defense policy where, is the, where there is no formal transfer of competence from member states to the Union. 
to put it differently, are the crisis management missions covered? Well, I won't develop um, further these points as they will be discussed by other speakers later on. I would just mention that after the entry into force of the Lisbon Treaty, competencies may have been clarified in several areas, but in the areas of common foreign and security policy and common security and defense policy, there is little clarity. So what conclusions can be drawn from this brief presentation? Well, despite the efforts to cover a legal vacuum and to offer a general framework on the conditions under which international organizations may be held responsible, the choices made by the International Law Commission fail to capture essential components of the general problematic on the responsibility of international organizations. Well, the real question is not whether the institutional veil of the international organizations has to be lifted, but whether the institutional veil of member states has to be drawn aside to show who is actually hiding behind. And the bilateral grounded principles on state responsibility do not easily apply to international organizations and any attempts to make them fit are uh, subject to a great amount of uncertainty. What is perhaps more um, concerning is the way in which these principles have been applied and interpreted in practice. There is a limited body of case law that has begun to emerge since the adoption of the articles, which highlights several practical questions and insoluble dilemmas surrounding the responsibility of factors involved in the implementation of the uh, expanding competencies of international organizations. It is worth noting that most of the cases submitted so far were di directed against member states and not against the international organizations involved. And this brings us to another major concern, the lack of mechanisms, particularly to, re um, to review international organizations uh, activities. Apart from the European Union, there are no judicial remedies available uh, in which issues of responsibility can be uh, resolved. National courts cannot, in principle, review international organizations because of the, their immunities. And on the other hand, most international courts do not have jurisdiction to do so. So this lack of available remedies explain why alleged victims have tried to sue member states instead. However, and I will conclude with this uh, remark, responsibility rules and remedies are the two sides of the same coin. If there are no mechanisms available for and accessible to the victims of wrongful acts or omissions, there will be few opportunities for the articles uh, to be further developed by practice and acquire the necessary authority to become the law in force. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Manuela, Professor Dusis, uh, for this uh, introductory and very interesting presentation, which uh, indeed set the scene for uh, today's conference and uh, uh, by, for highlighting uh, the relevance or perhaps also uh, irrelevance of uh, the ILC's work on, uh, on the topic uh, uh, when it comes to the EU uh, responsibility uh, and also for uh, posing some very interesting uh, and important questions that will be addressed uh, uh, by other uh, presenters uh, later on in today's conference. Uh, our second speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Nikolaos Vulgaris, uh, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the Athens uh, Public International Law PIL Center of the University of Athens and also a lecturer at the European Law and Governance School under the auspices of the European Public Law Organization. He's the author of a book entitled Allocating International Responsibility Between International Organizations and Member States, published in 2019 by Bloomsbury. And today he will deliver a presentation on the topic of derivative responsibility in the area and the curious case of the EU. Dr. Vulgaris, dear Nikos, you have the floor. Thank you very much, um, dear Aris, um, for your kind introduction. And um, after I heard um, 
everything that Professor Lucy um, has said in her in her introduction. I, I believe that almost half of the things that I wanted to say have already been covered, but I'll do my best to uh, give my take uh, on things. Um, may I share my screen first before I begin with my introduction? Just give me a sec. Please confirm someone whether you can see my screen. Yes, we can you see. Can. Okay, that's good. Thank you, thank you very much, thanks. Okay, um, so I guess I will uh, be rather brief um, since, as I said before, some of the things I wanted to discuss have already been covered, um, albeit I take a different stance from the one taken by uh, Professor Lucius, especially um, on the issue on whether the ARIO can uh, actually capture uh, the, the special, if we can call it like that, uh, case of the um, of the European Union as an international organization uh, in responsibility issues. So allow me to say um, um, from the outset that the issue of the responsibility of the European Union has lately lost its prime. There was a flurry of activity uh, during the drafting or of the um, articles uh, from the ILC and in the aftermath of their adoption in 2011, um, several books and articles were published during that time. And now uh, a decade after their finalization, um, now this has come, I won't say to a complete halt, but I mean, the production has diminished um, to, to, to a significant extent. As Professor Glavinis mentioned, I mean, in his, in his introduction, there is a significant disparity between the amount of existing practice on the one hand and the importance of the issues in play. So I guess this uh, lack of, of practice uh, can account for this uh, slowing down of um, academic production on the issue. And um, as I was um, uh, re revising the program of this conference, so uh, now I, I saw that the, uh, the invited speakers came from both a European law and an international law background. I was thinking what could be the, uh, the room for discussion between these the specialists that come from, from different backgrounds. And my main wor worry is that they both, um, they begin from a different premise. I mean, they're interested in the establishment of a different type of accountability mechanism. So international lawyers on the basis of international responsibility while EU lawyers are basically um, uh, dealing with internal uh, EU issues and the allocation of liability within that legal order. Um, on the other hand, uh, I believe that the, the common idea that could be further developed and, uh, um, that has, you know, a, common um, conceptual, um, um, let's say, commonalities on, on, on a conceptual basis is the idea of attribution um, as a normative exercise of attaching certain conduct to a particular author, but I guess that Melanie's um, presentation will, will address that issue, so I will not go further in that. I would rather like to focus on the issue of the allocation of uh, international responsibility between member states on the one hand and the EU on the other hand when uh, the member states implement uh, EU law. Um, to the extent that member states act under conditions of restriction of freedom in those cases, we could identify those scenarios as instances of derivative uh, responsibility or precarious responsibility or indirect responsibility. It has been called by many names. And this has been by far the most hotly debated topic as far as the EU uh, is concerned. And I expect that the next speaker will also deal uh, almost exclusively uh, with this Antonius. So my purpose is to first understand uh, what has been the EU's stance on this issue while commenting on the, uh, on the ARIO, even if uh, Professor Lucy has already mentioned a couple of things on this. Uh, then I will refer um, to the relevant ARIO provisions that uh, attempt to, to deal and uh, tackle the issue. And then I will make, uh, I will very briefly address two cases where the EU um, was, forced to, to, was forced to adopt a stance with respect to this issue, I mean, post ARIO. And uh, these two um, uh, uh, are the uh, ITLOS 2015 advisory opinion on the request submitted by the 
Sub-Regional Fisheries Commission and the draft accession agreement of the EU to the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, I'll be very briefly because Vasily's presentation is going to be on that, so a lot of overlap. Um, now, um, the EU stands on, on the area, I want to start with this. So, as Professor Lucis mentioned, so the EU, in fact, played um, a couple of cards when commenting on the ARIO, which are essentially the two sides of the same coin. The first is the, um, um, the diversity of international organizations, and then um, drawing on that, the special case that is the EU. So the, uh, the European Commission that was representing the, um, uh, the EU when commenting on the ARIO basically said that was unconvinced that the draft articles uh, reflect the diversity of international organizations and um, by identifying the EU as a regional uh, integration economic organization, um, it was in, the, the articles were incapable to uh, capture uh, the way those organizations uh, function. And the special features the, uh, the commission uh, specifically uh, mentioned, uh, I, I haven't mentioned all of them, were basically based on the uh, conferral of competent competencies from the uh, member states towards the, um, uh, the organization, the EU, and uh, respectively uh, the restriction of, let's say, the freedom that states, uh, member states have to act uh, in, the, um, in the international sphere, otherwise called the normative control exercised by the um, by the EU. Now, um, so the EU suggested basically two things. First, as was already mentioned, the Lex Specialis argument that the ARIO should deal with the EU on the basis of uh, special provisions uh, just for to accommodate this particular type of organizations in which the EU belongs. And on the other hand, and I think rather more, more importantly, the EU made a very, uh, the Commission made a very bold claim. That claim was that uh, internal EU rules are not international law. So in fact, the, um, the Commission said that uh, with respect to other international organizations, the argument could be made that their uh, internal, um, um, internal laws uh, can be categorized as international legal rules, however, um, the EU legal order is something special, something different, which cannot be categorized as international law. And I quote um, the, the Commission said, the relationship between the EU and its member states is not governed by international law principles, but by European law as a distinct source of law. Now, for international lawyers, this rings many bells, um, not in a good sense. I mean, so, uh, so this idea of European exceptionalism is um, something that is, let's say, a hard pill to swallow for, um, uh, for international lawyers. Uh, and I side with this uh, category of people, actually. So the, um, the ARIO in Article 64, as already mentioned, um, have... Um, um, have provided for the possibility of special rules um, uh, being um, uh, special rules of international law uh, operating um, 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 in order to establish the responsibility of or to allocate responsibility between an organization member states. However, in the commentaries to that uh, provision, the, the International Law Commission never actually said that this is the case with respect to the European Union. Um, rather, it left the, 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 the matter hanging, and um, it is a matter of, um, of further practice, um, the evolution of further practice, uh, to see whether this, uh, this uh, Lex Specialis uh, is under formation, has already, been, uh, has already formed. Um, I believe that the recent practice on uh, economic law, so WTO law and investment-related disputes, can show um, some relevant practice and, and as to whether Lex Specialis is currently under formation. But again, I think now Christina's presentation will, um, will have something to say about, about that. Uh, the, most, um, the most famous, um, let's say, illustration of such a, a special rule for the European Union um, uh, was made by um, 
um, a member of the um, of the legal team of the International Commission at the time, Frank Hofmeister, uh, who spelled it out in an article he wrote at the European Journal of International Law, and I have it here for you um, in 2010. Um, my take on this Lex Specialis argument is that it's not particularly compelling uh, because the uh, European, European Union never explained uh, why it needs special attribution rules uh, since uh, and why Articles 15 and 17 of, of the ARIO cannot address uh, the issue of normative control within the European Union. Um, um, because those articles, Article 15, dealing with the issue of direction and control uh, from the uh, organization towards member states, and the commentaries to that article expressly say that it is possible that uh, legal control or normative control could actually fall under Article 15. And uh, Article 17, on the other hand, discusses the issue of circumvention of obligations um, uh, of member states through the international organization that could actually also fall under this um, under this scenario. So um, my personal take is that the, uh, the EU did not give any convincing answers as to why those two uh, articles, the supervisions, cannot address uh, the issue of normative control and therefore um, the, um, the Lex Specialis argument in my view is not, uh, is not compelling. Now, um, Moving forward, um, how did the uh, ILC uh, regulate uh, this uh, this issue in its in its articles? Uh, in its um, yeah. Um, first of all, the first remark I want to make is that uh, we must have in mind that when member states are joining an international organization, they can be held internationally responsible for own conduct, which is compatible with their international obligations. What that means is that international organizations are not obligation-free zones for states. The $1 million question here is to identify what does this own conduct mean? Okay, so when can we separate the, the conduct of, an, of, of, me, of a member state of an international organization, um, albeit it being uh, uh, some, some conduct that performs um, in its capacity uh, as a member of an organization, it can be separated and be seen individually uh, and can be examined individually uh, as, a, um, as a conduct of that state. And so the European Court of Human Rights has um, Confirm this principle uh, in the Wayton Kennedy case and the Matthews case, the Bosworth case, and a strain of cases, and we like, which I need not repeat here, which has actually been um, uh, endorsed by the International Law Commission. So, this interaction between uh, the European Union and its member states can take two forms. First, it can exist in the context of membership. And the International Law Commission, in its commentary to Article 62, says that, said that. Uh, membership as such, and I quote now, does not entail for member states international responsibility when the organization commits an international wrong to act. So this could be seen as the exclusive international organization responsibility rule, um, which is also mirrored in Articles 58, 259, 2 and 62. Uh, so in such cases, um, um, the uh, states are shielded under the organizational veil. Uh, for example, when they vote in, in, in EU organs, then uh, the responsibility falls solely upon the international organization. So when states act as members. And um, here I have the, uh, the relevant provisions, which I will not read because it will take too much time. Um, and the um, other scenario is a scenario of interaction between the European Union and the member states as independent subjects um, of, um, of international law. And this is captured in articles 14 to 17 that deal with issues of direction and control, um, and, uh, issues of com complicity issues, coercion and circumvention of obligations, and the respective uh, part five, which deals with the same issues, but uh, from the opposite perspective. So while the first chapter deals with issues of um, responsibility of the organization in connection with acts of state. Uh, part five deals with responsibility of states in connection with conduct of international organizations. So in these cases, um, uh, member states can be, you know, um, so excuse me, the veil of international organization can be actually pierced 
and uh, member states can be exposed and their responsibility um, uh, can actually arise, so they act as states. And an example uh, I have found from the um, from a respective case from the European Court of Human Rights that recognized this principle. Um, it's a really hard to pronounce case, the Kokelviseri case versus the Netherlands, um, which dealt with a request by a domestic court uh, to the Court of Justice of the European Union for a preliminary ruling. All right, so um, let's um, take stock here and um, understand that there are basically um, two separate uh, ways uh, in which um, the ILC conceptualizes conduct by member states um, uh, with respect to how they uh, behave in an institutional, con uh, institutional context, excuse me. Um, so, um, the, uh, now moving forward to the um, to, to, to the cases I was referring to, I was referring to in my introduction, um, we will see that um, the ITLOS advisory opinion on the one hand and the draft uh, accession agreement on the other hand, um, in these two cases, the EU had actually taken a different stance on the uh, potential uh, responsibility of its, uh, of its member states. So in its ITLOS 2015 opinion, um, the question that was asked um, uh, from the um, Fisheries Commission to the Tribunal, especially four questions were in play there. The third one that is the uh, relevant one uh, in, a, in, in our case, and I quote, was where a fishing license is issued to a vessel within the framework of an international agreement with a flag state or with an international agency, shall the state or international agency be held liable for the violation of the fisheries legislation of the coastal state by the vessel in question. So where you see international agency, um, you can read international organization, and when you see uh, liability liable, you should read uh, international responsibility. That is uh, how the question translates in the terms um, of the ILC RU articles. So the EU in fact said, um, so the EU, I should say in advance, that uh, was concluding bilateral uh, accretion agreements uh, with third states uh, and um, therefore on the basis of those agreements, um, uh, states that, uh, excuse me, ships that um, uh, had the flag of EU member states were allowed uh, to fish in those uh, zones covered by the, uh, by the respective agreements. So in its oral submissions to the tribunal, the EU uh, said, and I quote, uh, the European Union is the only contracting part of the coastal state, exercising competence in respect of the EU member states. It follows from that that it is only the EU, the organization, that is potentially liable under international law for violation of obligations. And the tribunal endorsed this argument, and it famously held, and I quote again, the obligations of the flag state become the obligations of the international organization. So there, here we can see that um, the, uh, the tribunal uh, completely shields um, um, member states, and it only sees the, uh, the international organization uh, when um, we're talking about uh, the, the competence being given solely to the EU um, uh, and not to member states to, um, to deal with a particular issue, in our case, uh, the regulation of, of, uh, of, of fishing. Okay. On the other hand, in its draft accession agreement, uh, the EU took a different stance. Uh, and the provision that is of particular interest from that accession agreement is Article 1, Paragraph 4. Now, according to that article, and, I, and I'm going to read it because it's worth quoting it in full, an act, measure or omission of organs of a member state of the European Union or of person act on its behalf shall be attributed to that state, even if such act, measure or omission occurs when the state implements the law of the European Union including decisions taken under the Treaty on the European Union and under the Treaty on the Function of the European Union." End of quote. So uh, even if a, a correspondent mechanism was put in place in that accession agreement, that is, of course, it's, uh, as you uh, well know, it's no longer, uh, it's being renegotiated basically due to the, um, to the opinion of the Court of Justice of the European Union that has uh, decided to set it aside. Um, 
uh, Article 1, Paragraph 4, um, that was basically drafted with the blessings of the European Union and, and you know, um, uh, oh, lifts that veil and suggests that um, um, when uh, member states actually uh, act and they implement uh, EU law, then uh, it's them that are going to be uh, responsible for, um, for the implementation of such uh, legislation. When explaining why such the inclusion of, of this provision was inserted into the draft accession agreement, um, it was mentioned that this article was drafted for the sake of consistency with EU law. I guess that the idea behind it is that since uh, EU legislation suggests that um, uh, it is member states are we going to be responsible in those occasions, uh, then it is uh, to that particular actor that we should shift the blame. Which brings me back to, I mean, completes a circle and brings me back to um, uh, the arguments the EU put forward when commanding on the Dario. The one million dollar question is here is, what is the nature of the internal rules of the organization? Can those internal rules of the organization dictate where international responsibility is going to lie? And this is uh, an issue that the International Law Commission did not specifically and clearly address in its articles on responsibility. And if I may, this was why the, um, um, the issue of EU uh, responsibility is still left uh, hanging or as if, as still there is still some foggy spots uh, with respect to um, uh, whether the ARIO can uh, uh, specifically accommodate um, the European Union. Last thing I will say, and I will conclude with that, I, um, I mentioned at the beginning that there are two ways that uh, the member states can interact within the international organization that is the EU. What's the criterion to separate between the two? I believe that the criterion to, uh, to see whether the organizational veil can be lifted or not is whether member states exercise competence that lies with EU organs and member states do so in accordance with EU rules. So, when the, um, for example, when a domestic court is sending uh, the request uh, for a preliminary judgment to the Court of Justice of the European Union, it does so in accordance with EU rules, but it doesn't exercise competence that lies with EU organs, but rather with the domestic court itself. And this is why in such occasions, we cannot say that um, the EU shall be um, the, uh, the subject that's going to um, take the blame and therefore the organizational veil cannot be lifted. Thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to your uh, questions in the Q&A session. Thank you, Nikos, for your very informative presentation, shedding some more light on the questions posed at the beginning by Manuela. And uh, now our uh, third speaker for today is for this panel, is uh, Antonio Tsanakopoulos, an associate professor of public international law at the Faculty of Law of Oxford University and fellow in law at St. Anne's College. Uh, he has taught, Antonio has taught at some of the most prestigious universities of the world. He has published extensively in English and in French, or in French on the question of uh, responsibility of international organizations among many other topics. He's the secretary general of the ILA and uh, the Joint Secretary of the British Branch. Uh, his talk today is on the element of con normative control in attributing contact to international organizations. Uh, Antonios, you have the floor and I trust that you will be able to deliver your presentation in no more than 16 to 17 minutes. But no pressure, right, Aris? <laughs> Okay, well, um, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Aris. And of course, thanks to uh, Vasilis Pregadis, to um, the University of Thessaloniki and the, and the Hellenic branch of the, of the ILA for the invitation. Now, um, I'm, I suppose I'm going to have to um, pick up where um, the, um, the last uh, speaker left off and um, try to talk a little bit about the element of normative control in attributing conduct to international organizations more generally, but also 
a little bit more specifically about the European Union. Um, and, and in order to do that, well, what I, what I suggest I will do is, uh, first of all, um, perhaps I should um, uh, discuss um, a little bit uh, of the terminology so that we can distinguish things like attributing conduct as opposed to attributing responsibility, which um, is not always clear. Um, uh, and sort of explain this concept of derivative responsibility or vicarious responsibility or however else you may uh, want to call it that the ILC has opted for, which I don't think works at all. Um, and, uh, um, and then perhaps present uh, the problem um, that uh, emerges with the current treatment of the, of the issue in the, in the articles on the responsibility of international organizations. With, um, with a few examples and then um, try and offer, well, at least my solution um, uh, to the whole thing. So that's, that's what I propose to do. Um, I, I hope it's gonna be much less than 16 or 17 minutes, but um, that's always my hope. So in case I, I go over this, just, just cut me off and I'm sure I can bring it to an end. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, attribution, what attribution of conduct, um, surprisingly simple in, as a term, but surprisingly confusing to most people I've found. Um, so attribution of conduct is simply the legal operation of attaching conduct in the physical world, in the natural world, um, to what is essentially a fictional entity, which is a legal entity, something that only exists in our minds and is created there by the law. Um, because of course, I can, I can drink coffee or sneeze, but the EU cannot drink coffee or sneeze. Um, so there needs to be some, uh, some sort of attaching conduct in the physical world um, to... Um, to such a legal, to such a fictional um, legal entity. Um, in the case of states, we all know the rules, they're relatively simple. Uh, at least we know the general rule, which is that the, which is that the conduct of an organ of the state um, is automatically attributable to the state. So when the queen sneezes, the United Kingdom sneezes and so on and so forth. And, and I'm not saying this just to be facetious, is I'm just uh, trying to point out that attributing a conduct a particular course of conduct to an entity doesn't actually say anything about the responsibility of that entity. That is a question of whether that conduct is in breach. Um, but it's not something that's dealt with at the stage of attribution. The stage of attribution only has to do with whether that conduct is the conduct of that legal entity. So yes, when the Queen sneezes, the United Kingdom sneezes, that's not in breach of any primary obligations of the United Kingdom that I know of. So the examination stops there, but attribution has taken place. Right, um, so um, we have the rules of attribution of conduct um, to states. We know what they are. We have the general rule of Article Four uh, um, in combination with Article Seven. So conduct of the organ of a state is automatically attributable to the state, even if it's in excess of authority or contravention of instructions. Then we have some other special rules about what we consider conduct of states, and then we have some exceptional rules about conduct of entities that are not. Um, organs of the state that may be attributable in certain circumstances to the state. And that sort of completes the picture. Um, now, the, the ILC seems to have tried to sort of pretty much mirror the relevant rules um, for, uh, for international organizations, but I, I'm not sure it did so completely successfully. Um, in particular, also because it seems to have tripped itself up in the process, and I'll explain what I mean. But it is more complicated to, um, to attribute conduct to an international organization. It is more complex to attribute conduct to an international organization because here we have the intervention of another legal entity in the process of reaching the natural or the physical world. So um, uh, this, is, this is because international organization in general, international organizations in general do not have their own operational capacity. They need to borrow that operational capacity from states. They have organs, of course, through which they can exercise certain normative conduct, 
but they don't have organs through which they can usually exercise operational conduct. So um, let me explain what I mean with those terms. When we're talking about normative conduct, we're talking about conduct in law, passing law, making obligations, doing things like that. Um, so it would be what the parliament does um, in, in, in a state, um, or normative conduct would be the decision of a court or something along those lines. Whereas operational conduct would be when the police beat you up in Athens because you are protesting. Um, that would be operational conduct. So international organizations can undertake normative conduct, um, but they have very little capacity of undertaking operational conduct. So when we're talking about attributing operational conduct to an international organization, they will have to go through their member states. So they will have to employ organs of their member states in engaging um, in that operational conduct. And that um, throws a spanner in the works and we um, progress to the problem. Um, because um, international organizations have no operational conduct of their own, they will always engage in operational conduct through organs of states. But the problem is that the conduct of an organ of a state is already automatically attributable to the state. And the ILC thought that this was a bit of a problem because if that conduct is automatically attributable to the state, then even though they accepted that it could in principle be also uh, attributable to an international organization, in reality, in the way that they set up the articles, that almost never is the case. It's almost impossible to attribute the conduct of an organ of a state also to an international organization, except in very limited circumstances. But let me, um, because this, this sort of becomes a little bit uh, um, perhaps too abstract. Let me try and bring it down to a couple of examples that, that will um, sort of demonstrate the problem a bit more clearly. But before that, before that let me say that um, when it comes to um, when it comes to normative conduct, um, the uh, international organizations, it, it, the, the things are easy. Um, so normative conduct of an organ of an international organization is automatically attributable to the organization. That's nice and simple um, and, um, and, and obviously clear. But the problem is that usually normative conduct in and of itself will not be directly in breach of any international obligation of that organization unless it is implemented. Um, it can be in certain circumstances, but that will be relatively rare. If it is, then that's fine and, and, and it's easy to deal with. The, uh, the second thing is that the organization uses that normative conduct far more than a state does. It almost exclusively operates through that use of that normative conduct to achieve anything in the physical world because it has to use obligations that it can impose on its member states um, in order to achieve anything in the physical world. There is no other way for it to act operationally than through engagement of that normative conduct. To put it simply, let's take, um, a, a, and to demonstrate sort of the problem, let's take, um, well, my favorite, uh, obviously, uh, sort of neck of the woods, which is sanctions. And you can, I mean, we can use Security Council sanctions and bring the EU into that just, just for fun. So I assume that, um, you know, the Security Council in its ultimate wisdom decides that um, I'm a bit too dark and have a long beard. And for that reason, I must be associated with some pretty shady characters um, under 1267 uh, and the relevant resolutions from then in 1989. So ISIS, I don't know, whatever. Um, um, and they, uh, and, and the Security Council decides that I need, I need to have my assets frozen. Um, now, I personally don't have any assets, so that wouldn't, that wouldn't worry me too much, but assume I did. Um, and so one day, um, I, uh, I go to the bank here in, um, in the UK and I put in my card and try to withdraw money and then no money comes out even though I know I have some money in my account so I go to the bank manager 
um, and she says, I'm sorry, um, your, your account is frozen um, because your name appears in an order in council, um, uh, which uh, orders us to freeze your account. Um, and so you have to take it up with the, um, with the treasury. So then I go to the treasury and I say, why did you tell the bank manager to freeze my account? And the treasury says, assume this is before 2016, so we're still in the EU. Um, and the treasury says, well, because uh, your name appears in a regulation um, of uh, the European Union, which uh, tells us to uh, tell the bank manager to freeze your account. So I go to the European Union and I'm like, why did you tell the treasury to tell the bank manager to freeze my account? And they're like, oh, because your name appears in a security council decision that tells us to tell the treasury to tell the bank manager to freeze your account. Um, as you see, there's quite um, um, quite a lot of, and then I try to go to the security council and I can't, of course, because for the security council, I generally don't exist. Um, so this sort of shows the chain of normative control exercised in this particular case. So the Security Council imposes a strict obligation or the EU itself imposes a strict obligation on member states to undertake certain conduct in the physical world that is freezing my account, um, which then I am, um, I'm trying to figure out who undertook that conduct. So is this conduct of the Security Council of the EUN? That means is that conduct of the EU? Is that conduct of the UK? Is that conduct of all of them? Or is it conduct of none of them? The way that the ILC articles on the responsibility of international organizations have been structured at the moment, essentially say when we're talking strictly about conduct, that this is only conduct attributable to the state. There is no way to attribute that conduct either to the EU or the UN because um, the state organ is not fully seconded to either the EU or the UN. So the conduct of the state organ does not count as a conduct of the EU or the UN, nor um, is that conduct controlled by the EU or the UN, because in Article 7 of the Articles on the Responsibility of uh, International Organizations, the ILC understands control as factual control on the ground. That means the same control as in Article 8 of the Articles on State Responsibility. That means the same control as um, the ICJ has discussed in Nicaragua or in Bosnia genocide. So somebody needs to be holding me by the neck and forcing me to do something operationally on the ground. It doesn't include normative control. Instead, what they do um, is to say the EU or the, um, or the UN might become responsible, not have the conduct of the state organ attributable to them, they might become responsible in a derivative manner because they have either coerced the state or the state organ, thus the state, or because um, they, um, uh, or because they try to circumvent their own obligation through those peculiar provisions in, in article, well, somewhat peculiar provision in article 15 of the articles on the responsibility of international organization, the very peculiar provision in Article 17. Um, the, the other problem that this creates in practice is a problem of double evasion, because essentially the international organization is able to hide behind the fact that the state organ is acting, and the state is itself able to hide behind the fact that the international organization has ordered, has normatively controlled, uh, demanded, uh, the conduct. And we've had lots of problems with this. It was mentioned by Manuela earlier um, that um, uh, that we don't, that the jurisprudence mainly focuses on um, sort of like claims being brought against states. The reason for that is very simple, and she mentioned that as well, which is that um, you can't sue an international organization in most cases 
um, in, uh, in any court or tribunal. So what you do is you, you basically sue the state. And for many years, for example, with respect to sanctions, what would happen would be you would sue the state, you would try to bring a claim against the state, and then the state would simply say, but I had no option but to do this because the EU made me do it or the Security Council made me do it, in which case the court or tribunal would say, well, if it's the EU or the UN, sorry, we don't have jurisdiction, we can't deal with it. If it was a domestic court, they would say it's immune. If it would be the European Court of Human Rights, they would say, ah, uh, too bad they are uh, they're not within our jurisdiction and so on and so forth um, and of course if you if you went to the international organization well for one you couldn't go uh, and even if you tried to sort of make a claim the response would be that's conduct of the organ of a state so that uh, is not our problem so we've had this problem of double evasion right there um, now how can, how can this be resolved? I think there were very many ways for this to have been resolved in the articles um, on, uh, uh, on international organizations without uh, this convoluted approach of derivative responsibility, um, uh, simply through provisions for uh, the, the, uh, the attribution of conduct. I think, first of all, I mean, Article 6 alone would be enough um, to deal with this because article six as opposed to article six of ario um, as opposed to to article uh, four of uh, the articles on state responsibility clearly says conduct of an organ or an agent of an international organization so it adds the concept of agent and an agent is something far less uh sort of demanding than an organ in the sense that the ilc itself says an agent is someone through which the international organization acts. That means the UK Treasury or the Hellenic Coast Guard is an agent of an international organization when they are someone through which the international organization acts. And that should be enough to allow parallel attribution of that conduct both to the UK and the UN or both to the... Uh, to Greece, if we're talking about the Hellenic Coast Guard and the EU in particular circumstances. Um, and yet the ILC tripped itself up by saying, well, yes, but if it's an organ of a state, then it's automatically attributable to the state. So the organ of the state can't be an agent of the organization. I'm not sure why they did that. Um, then in Article 7, which they could also have used, um, they said, well, uh, the conduct of a state organ could be attributable to the organization if it's under the control of the organization, but then they define control as exclusively factual control on the ground. So along the Nicaragua sort of Bosnia genocide lines. Why? Absolutely unconvincing why they would do that when international organizations are entities that hardly ever exercise factual control over anything. I mean, let alone how difficult it is to show that a state is exercising um, factual control on the ground over any entity. I mean, it has almost never been proven. It wasn't proven in Nicaragua or in Bosnia genocide for that matter. But it certainly uh, um, it didn't need to be that way. They could have considered that because international organizations almost never act through such factual control, they only act through normative control, they should have included that. In contrast, states almost never act through normative control. States cannot exercise normative control over other states. They can exercise normative control over individuals, but because of sovereign equality and what have you, they can't exercise so normative control over other states. Um, Greece cannot pass laws that tell Italy what to do. I mean, that's, that's elementary. Um, and yet that's precisely the way in which international organizations act. So the difference there is clear. Instead, what they do, so they could have solved this as in, in that simple manner. Instead, what they do, and you heard Nicola say earlier, well, they said the Article 15 coercion. Article 15 makes absolutely no sense because coercion relies on, on effective control, relies on control. So how can be control in Article 15 be normative control and in Article 7 only factual control? Why? Why that difference? It only says control. It makes absolutely no sense. And for what? For coercion. 
absolutely no meaning. And then in Article 17, it talks about this convoluted concept of circumvention. Um, oh, but if you sort of like authorize someone or demand of someone to do something that circumvents your obligation because you're not breaching your obligation, but you're making them breach an obligation that they may or may not have, but you certainly have. I mean, what the hell is this and how does this even, how do they expect this to even work in any circumstances? Um, the Anios, I hate interrupting charismatic speakers like you, but perhaps you might want to wrap up in a I'm, minute. I am, I am, I am wrapping, I am wrapping up uh, immediately. So effectively, you might ask, well, okay, so they went with, they went with derivative responsibility. What's the problem? Well, there are another, a number of problems, and that's why I, I think it doesn't work. First of all, um, derivative responsibility is responsibility for the act of another. In reality, in principle, derivative responsibility always establishes new primary rules. It doesn't refer to secondary rules. It establishes new primary obligations on the entity. Do not circumvent, do not coerce. Um, that's not something that can be done, um, um, at least by the ILC in, in this way. And that's not something that has been accepted uh, by states. The second, the second thing which makes it completely completely unintelligible in my in my way is that if the problem is authorization the decision then that makes the decision and and you can't use a decision to circumvent that makes the decision itself wrongful but if the decision were to be wrongful you don't need that at all because if the decision is wrongful that's normative conduct and that's automatically attributable to the international organization so a completely vicious circle created there by the ILC which i think um, Professor Gaia might have, and then Judge Gaia, and now just Gaia, may have regretted uh, uh, down the line. Um, uh, but the point is that this can easily be resolved by just as accepting that there can be such thing as effective normative control of an international of uh, uh, of a state and a state organ by an international organization. Which this should lead to attribution to the international organization without precluding attribution to the state. We're only attributing conduct. Conduct can be attributable both to the state and the international organization. Might be wrongful for not for one, but not for the other. Might be wrongful for both, or might be wrongful for neither. But the decision, the discussion, shouldn't stop at the stage of attribution. Attribution should should have been something far far easier. And normative control um, should be um, a link allowing attribution in the special case of international organizations because that's what they do. So thanks for your enormous patience and thanks for uh, bringing me back to I always think that was like four minutes uh, I'm afraid I, it was it was a bit more <laughs> I apologize profusely no problem at all thank you very much Antonio for your presentation and uh, indeed uh, I am I think we have kind of used the time allocated to us and I do take my share of responsibility for that as uh, chairing the session, but I think it was a truly uh, very interesting and very informative session that indeed uh, uh, set the scene for uh, this, uh, for the topic of today's conference. Uh, I would uh, guess that both the organizers and our uh, esteemed keynote speaker will uh, uh, allow us uh, some time for discussion. I already see that there is uh, one of our at attendees, uh, uh, that have raised her hands, uh, Natia Kvalia, and I saw the hand of uh, Akis Papastavridis uh, earlier. Uh, Aki, you also like to ask questions. Let us start with uh, Natia, and then a uh, question by Akis Papastavridis. You will both be given the opportunity to ask your questions. Please identify yourselves, say to whom you address the question, and then we will have a final round of uh, answers by our uh, panelists. So, Natia. Okay, uh, uh, I will continue. Well, let us continue with uh, Akis Papastavridis. Uh, many thanks, uh, uh, Chair and Aris. Different Aris, and uh, it's wonderful to hear uh, my colleagues beforehand. Uh, uh, thank you and excellent presentations. Uh, just a point uh, I think was going to Nicola's uh, uh, presentation and the point I made uh, toward the, with reference to Itlos. And uh, I would just want to, to, to ask you, and maybe you can share your view, and everybody wants to join in 
the um, the oral presentation of Europe, European Union, I think, got it right. Said that when you have an agreement between European Union and let's say Senegal, everything you know, every obligation that is uh, under this agreement is only obligations of uh, European Union. So any breach of these obligations are attributable are attributable in the sense not of Pandonius, but in the sense of responsibility to European Union, right? Um, but the, the judgment, as it was the quotation you made, uh, you refer to Nicolas, I think the problem is up uh, confusingly. Uh, it says that every obligation of the flag state will be obligation of the European Union in this regard. I'm not so sure about this. Uh, in the context of fisheries, and there are people that are also uh, well versed in, in all the sea amongst us, so there are other obligations that the flag state does have, obligation under, for example, uh, 93 compliance agreement on fisheries. Or other kind of obligations. Are these obligations really, in your view, and you know, obligations of the European Union because the vessels are there per, per pursuant to an agreement with Senegal? So I mean, yes, with respect to obligations that they are Article 4 of let's say this treaty, yes, this is violated it's the European Union, but all the other obligations are attributable to the state, the flag state, and I agree with Adonis and his, uh, his comment on this attribution point. And it is attributable, and the flag state is, still has responsibility, right? Which is responsible of the flag state, not of the European Union. This is my, my take and my critique, actually, to the Petros in this regard. And I just want to hear your views. And again, congratulations for your uh, very thoughtful uh, speeches. Thanks. Thank you, Agis, for your question. Uh, before giving, I will give the floor to Nicolas actually to uh, for his answer. In between, uh, may I ask uh, all other panelists or attendees if there are any questions to either raise their hands or if they want, uh, they can uh, type their question in the uh, Q and A. Um, in, in our Q and A's, uh, and uh, we will uh, then continue with. Uh, uh, the discussion. Nicolas. Thanks very much. Uh, may I show the quote once more, just for the sake of everyone? The quote that Aki is supposed to. Here it is. Um, yeah, I completely agree with what you said, Aki. I mean, the court should have been way more cautious <laughs> um, in, its, um, uh, in, in, its, in its decision. Uh, if you suggest that um, this applies to extra agreement uh, obligations, of course it does not. I mean, I, I completely agree with you. I mean, it shouldn't and uh, can't apply to extra agreement obligations. And it shouldn't apply to I infra agreement obligations either. I mean, in the way it is addressed here, okay? This is an attribution issue, not an issue of uh, moving obligations around. Okay, I completely agree with what you said. I mean, and I don't think it's, um, I mean, um, it's a matter of discussing it further, but yeah, you're, you're right. <clears throat> Thank you, Nicolas, for a very brief uh, uh, answer. And uh, um, I don't know whether Nadia can now, uh, you can open your microphone if there is a question. Or perhaps, or perhaps there wasn't. She didn't want to. Um, she didn't want to have a, uh, to ask a question, but it was uh, uh, accidentally hand raised. Um, I had one question that I wanted also to address uh, to Nicolas. Uh, Nicolas said that perhaps uh, the solution would have been for the International Law Commission to clarify more the precise nature of these Lex Specialis rules. Probably Lorenzo will also have to say something about that later on. But uh, thinking of the different ways that those, Lex Spe those rules of the organization, to, to, to call them better, uh, are being introduced to the international legal order, um, declarations of competence, uh, incorporation uh, in total in the agreement, renvoi from the international agreement to the internal rules, etc. Um, would it be possible for the International Law Commission to create a rule that will cover all those cases of how those rules what kind of nature they have, because their nature changes on the basis of how we introduce them to the international legal order, perhaps. Um, I, I guess, Mr. Speaker, that I may speak. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, Vasilis, uh, thanks. Thanks for that comment. Um, 
Um, you are essential. I, I don't necessarily disagree with your uh, with your comment. I mean, if you look into 59 paragraph two or 58 paragraph two, that uh, uh, the ILC mentioned the rules of the organization as a criterion, and it said that if if member states comply with those rules, then they are shielded. And therefore, so I mean, what I wanted the ILC to do is to rather um, um, adopt, uh, if you like, a stance. Saying that um, um, the the I mean prima facie those rules can contribute ca can constitute or should constitute um, um, uh, international law if they um, um, you know um, if some criteria are fulfilled. Okay, so for example, uh, if for example uh, the way they are uh, devised um, uh, and um, I don't know what else they, they could have said, but in any case, leaving the matter completely in limbo doesn't doesn't help and there was there were many many articles for example there was one article by Christiane Alborn that I can think about right now right after the um, the ARIO were, uh, were released uh, uh, exactly saying uh, commenting on this dual nature of the rules of the uh, of the international organization that could be conceived in, in a double way yes as you said I expect Lorenzo would say a couple of things about this too but um, I, I would expect that so something in order to, to clarify this especially since uh, the, the LC uses this term many times throughout the articles, okay, but without giving any further any further guidance, your point is completely taken, okay. Um, nevertheless, I um, I still have some uh, misgivings uh, as to the way it was um, used by by the by the LC. I know I don't uh, I'll answer your question, but uh, my um, my comment is one on principle, okay. I don't have a good answer to you. I, I have a question though on that, Vasilis. What what else could they be if not international? If we're not talking about droit de rive, if we're not talking about uh, the, if the rules of the organization are not simply rules which the organization has the power to make internally by virtue of its constitutive instrument, which after all is international law, what else could they be? They could be perhaps, no, the question is that if they are incorporated, for instance, in an international agreement, then they are not anymore only rules of the organization, but they bind also third parties and they can be applied as part of international law, as part of the solution. At that moment, they are a true lex specialis. Now, there is a question also, and I'm sure Lorenzo will have to say much more, that perhaps even if they stay within the legal order of the international organization, they might even in that case be part of international law, which is a little bit more problematic. But we will hear about that, I think. Okay, perhaps we can leave it there. I just don't see it, I don't see it as problematic. I mean, there are rules that are not binding on everyone. There are rules that are binding on those who accept them. In fact, all rules are only binding on those who accept them in one way or another, if you want to take it all the way back. So what would it, why would it be a problem if the rules of the organizations don't actually bind third parties? I mean, that, that, would, be, that would be the meaning. Uh, if they don't bind third parties, they are not lex specialis for those third parties. Like they can, those third parties cannot be bound by them. They, they cannot be a lex specialis that regulates the issue of EU responsibility in the international legal order. They can be within the national, the I.O. legal order. Absolutely not. So for the third party, you would just go with the relevant, with the regular rules of responsibility. And then that is a mess for the for the, for the the EU to deal with it for itself with it, with, in its own procedures. Why should it be the burden of Togo to sort of sit down and figure out what, what, what mess the EU may have uh, sort of introduced with its competences here and there? I mean, it, 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 okay. I understand this is not this is not for discussion now. I'm just throwing it out there, and I understand Lorenzo may go may come back to it. Uh, th th thank you both for, uh, and I'm very very pleased that the discussion has hit it up. And uh, uh, the, the name of Lorenzo has been mentioned a couple of times or more. Uh, so I will have to give him the floor, and then we'll have a question of uh, by Vladis Vladislav. And I think that then we can uh, call it a day for the first uh, session of today. Yes, thank you so much and for <laughs> mentioning me. Of course. And I'm, I, I'm going to speak about this later, so I'm going to want to take an example. But what I want to say the fact is the fact that Antonio Sanopoulos, I think, he found the answer to his, his fundamental question of why the ILC did that fundamental mistake, which I totally agree with the mistake and I totally agree also with the 
conclusions that you would make. And the mistake derives exactly from the incapacity to deal with the issues of the rules, which is the incapacity to deal with the, what is an international organization. I think. Because it's the characteristic of the legal system of international organizations, whether the rules are international or internal or whatever they are. I think this is the answer to your uh, fundamental question. And later on, I will uh, comment more, but just wanted to say this. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Lorenzo, for your intervention. And uh, uh, I have seen that there is a, a hand raised by Vladislav. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I really enjoyed listening to all the presentations. A quick question to Antonio, though. I also follow completely all of your arguments and I really share them. Uh, I wonder, you know, sort of to pick up on that scenario, which you were, you know, like a bit ludicrous, but still, uh, which is a, a, a part of the real life uh, in many cases. Uh, what, what would be in your view, uh, the relevance or no relevance whatsoever of the degree of such normative control. So to what extent a particular decision and the way in which it may be drafted or particular legislation or particular policy, if it leaves no specific guidance to the implementers in terms of the actual means uh, they are left with, and they will be perfectly capable of either applying the means so as to still be in compliance with a particular uh, prescriptions, or perhaps they could deviate from home. So to what extent the, the degree of normative control matters or doesn't matter at all at this stage? Thanks, Vladislav. That's, I mean, obviously an excellent question. I, I just didn't have the time to go into that and I don't want to take too much time now, but when I, re um, when I refer to normative control as allowing attribution, as being an attribution link, I, I am referring to effective normative control. And what I mean by effective normative control is the normative control that is exercised in the case of strict obligations. So for, for example, when the Security Council says, you must freeze the assets of Antonios Janakopoulos, that's an obligation of result. It's a strict obligation. There's nothing that the, that the, that the state can do other than freeze my account. If they don't freeze my account, they're in breach of their obligation. Or similarly, if the EU says, you know, Vladislav sounds like a Russian name, so you should freeze his assets too, right? So in that case, there is nothing that the state can do but uh, sort of achieve that particular result. If there is any discretion left to the state, then that becomes a different question. You can, and the, in fact, the EU courts have quite explicitly recognized this in the different way that they have treated the sanctions regimes of 1267 and 3073 of the Security Council in decisions like CADI on the one hand and, and OMPI uh, on the other, the Organisation de Mujahedin du, du Peuple de Rang. So you can, you can see there quite clearly that when it comes to the 1267, which imposes strict obligation, the EU takes one route, whereas in, in the other case, which is or originally took one route, let's say the, the court of the, the, what was then the court of first, first instance in 2005 took one route, whereas the same court in the 1373 regime said, well, wait a minute, in 1373, the Security Council tells you to blacklist terrorists, but it doesn't tell you who are terrorists. So if you, the EU, in the exercise of your discretion, determine that, you know, Antonius looks dodgy and for that reason he's a terrorist, then fine, you can do that, but that was not strictly imposed by the Security Council. You were not acting under the normative control of the Security Council or the effective normative control of the Security Council. You exercise discretion and your, the discretion you exercise is for that reason reviewable for compliance with the rules for exercising that discretion under EU law. And it would be the same for a state under the state law and so on and so forth. So the degree of control obviously is crucial and it comes down to effective normative control and strict obligations create effective normative control. If it's non-strict obligations, then we can go into looking at what the obligation is, what kind of discretion it leaves and whether that discretion is meaningful or, or not meaningful in the circumstances. So that would be sort of like the, the shortest way in which I could answer this. So thank you, Adonios. Thank you all uh, for uh, your presence. Uh, I think you, uh, we can agree that it was a great panel, great opening panel. 
and uh, congratulations once again uh, and our thanks to the organizers, the Kuva Foundation, uh, together with the Hellenic branch of the International Law Association. And uh, I think that you can all join me in uh, thanking and congratulating our speakers. And uh, thank you all for also for a lively discussion. And uh, I now give the floor back to Vasilis.